Okay guys, so hopefully you've seen part 1 of this Honda NSX series, as I'm going to jump straight into part 2 by measuring the paint's thickness, and I also hope that you like the sound of my voice, as unlike in the first video, you're going to be hearing a lot of it in this second video. Now straight off the bat, I was getting some seriously high paint thickness readings, up to 300 microns on the bonnet, which is much higher and not even close to being typical for OEM paint. So it would be a fairly safe bet to assume that the bonnet had been repainted. However, you'd actually lose that bet. After some further research on the original Honda NSX and Honda's paint job on it, I actually discovered that the owners and other detailers had recorded up to 350 microns of paint thickness on the top and bonnet panels, and up to 250 microns on the side panels. And I even discovered that the new Honda NSX as perhaps the thickest ever recorded OEM paint of any car, being 400 plus microns which is absolutely insane and just makes me love Honda even more for caring enough to do that. And as you'll see, once we get to testing and polishing the paint, I was able to confirm that the paint on the bonnet and side panels actually was identical not only in look but also in hardness and sensitivity. However, after a closer inspection, I did discover that the rear bumper and rear left quarter panel had in fact been repainted in the past, also having a minor burn mark where you could see the original paint beneath. As was the case with the black roof, that although there were half decent resprays, they just weren't to the same level of the rest of the OEM paint, that I have to say was perhaps one of the best I've seen from any car manufacturer. As we have a look at the paint and defects with some proper defect spotting lights, it's fairly plain to see that there's what I consider to be a moderate amount of light swirls, with a few deeper scratches mixed in. So nothing too horrific, but also nothing too mild. And I'll also add that the claying process most likely added a few more light swirls, which is absolutely normal. And although it's hard to properly see the paint in the footage, due to all the metallic flakes, I could definitely see a lack of true clarity that my guess was due to some light oxidation and also likely due to the paint not being refined as good as possible, as there is a light haze over the finish preventing the light from cleanly and sharply bouncing and reflecting off it. But as we have a look at the black paint on the roof that's a lot easier to capture on camera, hopefully you'll see a much larger array of defects, including some deeper scratches, water spots and bird poo etchings and some definite patchiness in the finish, which would indicate to me that the paint is perhaps a little softer and more sensitive than the rest. But I also saw indications that suggested to me that it was partly due to the quality of the resprayed paint, and perhaps some overly aggressive paint correction on the roof in the past. But apart from that, and the other two resprayed panels that I mentioned earlier, the defects were fairly consistent and really more of a light to moderate level compared to most cars I detail.
So onto the test section. Now I've been testing a lot of Shine Supply products over the last couple of months with some really great success. So I decided to continue that on this car. From left to right, we have the two more aggressive compounds, Chop Top and Flat Top, followed by Classic Cut and Classic Polish, which are the more medium compound and light polish. And finally, Classic Finish, which is more of a super fine polish. And I'll be using Throwback as my panel wipe, which is slightly more capable than a standard IPA wipe, but so far it's been working quite well. I've also got the pads laid out from most aggressive to least aggressive, which are all Lake Country pads, starting with the coarse, then medium and fine microfiber pads, followed by the foam coarse, polishing and finishing STO pads. And I'm basically going to be trying a few combinations of these pads and compounds on the Reapers LHR15 Mark III polisher to see what the paint responds best to. Now the best starting point is always the least aggressive method, but it still needs to have the potential to work. So seeing that the defects aren't just super light and minor swirls, but also aren't extremely deep or severe scratches, a good starting point based on my past experience would be the orange SDO foam pad with classic polish. As if the paint turns out to be super soft Honda paint, I really don't want to use anything more aggressive as it will remove more clear coat than is necessary and also leave a horrible finish that will be difficult to refine. But I also don't want to use anything less aggressive than this gentle combination as it won't have the potential to address these particular defects. I'm starting with four to five small pea-sized drops of polish on a fresh pad, but I'll drop down to two or three drops once the pad is primed. I've also got the polisher set to speed four and a half. I'll spread the polish over the panel to start with, and then using just moderate pressure and a slow arm movement, I'll work a section about six times the size of my pad, and I'm gonna do three rows of overlapping passes with my machine to make up a set of passes. When polishing automotive paint, much like most things in life, you always wanna try and find that perfect balance. So if I use too much compound and too much pressure with an excessive machine speed, I'm gonna compromise the finishing qualities of my work. Whereas if I don't use enough product or pressure and my arm speed is too fast, I'm going to compromise the cutting abilities of my work. But the tricky thing is that every paint and its defects are different. So what may work perfectly on one car may fail miserably on another. And that's why testing and refining both your choice of products and technique is so vital. But you always need a starting point, and for me personally, this is a great general place to start in relation to the products and techniques. And based on what I see in the test results, I can tweak and adapt my process. Also important to note is your wipe off. It's really best to firstly remove the polish residue with a dry microfiber cloth, and then follow up with your panel wipe cleaner to remove the lingering polishing oils. True paint correction is about having the ability to cleanly and accurately assess your results. So if you have polishing oils filling and masking existing defects, you'll be misled into believing that the paint looks better than it truly is. And most important of all, you have to use a quality light source. If you think for a second that your overhead fluorescence, halogens, floodlights or some little handheld pen light is going to adequately expose paint defects, you're sadly mistaken and you just have to compare them side by side to a proper defect spotting light to see the massive difference. And just as vital is your lighting position. Don't position the light too close to the paint, as it will wash out the defects, but don't position it too far away, as it won't effectively illuminate them. When inspecting a test section, I'm always looking for two things. Firstly is cut or existing defect removal, and based on what I'm seeing in this section, I'd say that I've removed a good 70% of the defects, addressing all the lighter swells, but I still have quite a few of the more moderate and slightly deeper scratches still in place. Secondly, I'm looking at the gloss and saturation or clarity in the finish that I've created. And based on what I was seeing, it was a vast improvement with increased saturation and the light bouncing off the paint and reflecting so much clearer and cleaner. So my conclusion in this first test section is that I still need a more aggressive combination to eliminate the existing defects, but as far as finishing qualities go, this combination and technique has worked extremely well. 
And what that tells me about the paint at this early stage is that it's most likely not an overly rock hard paint as I was able to remove a large portion of the defects with a very gentle combination. But it's also not overly soft or sensitive paint as I was able to finish down extremely well without too much difficulty. But beyond that, I need to do some more testing to discover more. So seeing that I needed to achieve more cut to eliminate those more moderate scratches, yet still try and retain a quality finish, I stepped up to a slightly more aggressive pad in the form of the Lake Country Black Finishing Microfiber Pad, but still using the same classic polish. Now microfiber pads with their thousands of tiny strands really do need to be properly primed before use. But apart from that my overall technique was very similar to the steps I described in the first test section. One thing I have discovered about most of the Shine Supply compounds is that they do seem to work very well with the more demanding microfiber pads. And microfiber does massively increase any compound's cutting ability. So using this more gentle black microfiber pad, I should also see an increased cutting ability, but I'm also hoping that I'll be able to finish quite well. But in saying that, I've personally found in the past that on softer paint types, I rarely use microfiber due to its increased heat that softer paints just don't respond well to. Now after having a look at the results in this second test section, I can see that I've removed at least 90% and far more of the existing defects with just a single pass, which is quite impressive considering that I'm using quite a fine polish and the least aggressive microfiber pad that I have. And although I know it's hard to see on camera, just as I predicted the microfiber pad has left a fine haze and some tiny micro marring behind in the finish. So although this combination will in fact remove 90% plus of the existing defects, which is close to my goal but not quite enough, it still won't have the potential to finish with perfect gloss and clarity. And this further indicates to me that the paint is more on the medium to softer side, but I definitely wouldn't say it's a super soft or sensitive paint as the compounding haze and marring is quite minimal. My goal and any detailer's goal in relation to paint correction is and should be to try and find a single stage combination that both cuts and finishes perfectly. And although in many cases this just isn't possible, I'm personally finding that with today's fantastic compounds, pads and machines matched to a good technique, I can single stage more and more paints to perfection that just wasn't possible to do as little as 5 to 10 years ago. And single staging paint not only saves time, products and cost, but it's also less aggressive on the paint and it retains more of the original clear coat. And although I do understand that detailers want to and need to get down to paint correction as quickly as possible, you may find that if you take a little more time to further test more possible combinations and refine your technique, it will in fact save you time, money and be more respectful in preserving the car's existing paint or clear coat. So for a third combination, I went back to a foam pad, but stepped up to the light cutting Lake Country Blue SDO pad, using the same classic polish. My goal here would be to create more cut than the first orange SDO pad, but also to achieve a better finish than the black microfiber pad. And once again, I stuck to the same technique as so far my machine speed, arm movement and pressure and the amount of passes seem to be working quite well.
Now so far, out of all three sections, this was definitely the best one in which I was able to achieve that same perfect clarity in the finish. However, although I was again close to eliminating most of the defects in this third test section, there was still a good 10 to 15% of them remaining, meaning that I still needed a little more cut. The thing you need to appreciate about the existing defects left behind on the paint after you do a set of passes is that they are far more difficult to remove than lighter ones. So in my experience, although there's only 10 to 15% of them remaining, they will be a lot more difficult to remove than the first 85 to 90% of defects. For a fourth test section, I stepped up even further to the Lake Country Medium Microfiber Pad, once again using the same polish. Now, although I wouldn't expect this pad to finish well at all on this particular paint, I would expect it to address all the existing defects. And I've been correcting paint long enough to know that sometimes you do get surprised with certain combinations that render results quite differently than you'd expect. Now in this case, I did in fact get the results I was expecting, which was a good 95 to 99% defect removal. But the compromise was quite a poor finish with noticeably increased levels of haze and micro marring. So although this combination will eliminate almost all the defects, it won't even come close to finishing to an acceptable level. Now regardless of whether I use this or any other of the combinations moving forward, I'm always gathering important information about the paint and at this stage I know exactly how aggressive I need to be to remove the existing defects and I also know exactly how gentle I need to be to create a perfect finish as well as knowing how to achieve this in a two-stage process. However, I still don't know for sure if there's a combination out there that will allow me to do this in a one-stage process and I'm not giving up on that just yet. Now seeing that the Blue Foam SEO pad is about the most aggressive pad I can use to still achieve a perfect finish, I decided to use it in conjunction with Classic Cut to see if it could potentially give me both the cut and finish I was searching for. I also just slightly adjusted my technique using my machine at speed 5 and incorporated a touch more pressure. This is the reason why I sometimes spend hours and hours during my testing phase. The cut and defect removal was easily 95% plus and the finish was absolutely brilliant with fantastic levels of gloss and clarity. But more so important, it's just a single stage that'll save me time, products and preserve more clear coat than I could have by using a multiple correction stage process. It's really important to understand that detail in products, equipment and techniques have massively changed over the last couple of decades. 15 to 20 years ago, I would have most likely been doing a three-stage process with my rotary and several wool and foam pads and several compounds and polishes to achieve these very same results. And 10 to 5 years ago, I would have been doing a two-stage process with my rotary and DA polisher with at least a couple of different pads and compounds to get these same results. But today, I can achieve these results with just a single stage, which is a true reflection of just how good compounds, pads and machines have gotten 
together with a little knowledge and practice in your methods and techniques. And there is absolutely no compromise in the quality, which is just amazing and almost unbelievable. So I really don't need to use any of the more aggressive microfiber pads or any of the heavier cutting compounds as Classic Cut, which I'd personally say is more of a medium compound, is more than capable of addressing these particular defects on this particular paint type. Now although to my eye the finish is as good as possible, it doesn't always mean that the potential to achieve increased gloss and clarity doesn't exist. So to confirm this, I did a follow-up test with the first combination of Classic Polish on the orange pad. Looking at the results, there was basically no distinguishable difference between the original single stage combination with the blue pad and classic cut compared to the second stage with the orange pad and classic polish. Meaning that there's basically no point in doing this second stage other than wasting time, product and needlessly removing more clear coat. For a final attempt to see if a super fine polish and super fine pad could in fact increase gloss and clarity further. I use the Lake Country Black SDO pad with Shine Supply Classic Finish. Now, although it may be difficult to see in the footage, the finish was actually a slight step down with minimal amounts of haze left in the finish. It may be strange to some to understand how such a fine and gentle combination could in fact induce more haze than a slightly more aggressive combination, but in truth, I found this to be the case on many occasions. It could possibly be because the pad is just too soft to adequately work the polish and abrasives, leading to inconsistencies in the finish or it could be a multitude of other factors that I could guess. But in truth, we don't always know why certain combinations work better than others, and anyone who pretends to have all the answers is just simply lying. So with being completely satisfied that the finish is without a doubt as good as possible, I locked it in, but was still a little amazed and impressed with both the blue SDO pad and classic cut for their amazing cutting and finishing qualities as a pair. Now, as I mentioned earlier, at first, I believed that the bonnet had been repainted due to its extremely high paint thickness readings. So to make sure that the same combination would also work on the rest of the paint, I decided to do a quick test to see if the cut, finish and overall results would be the same. And as you will hopefully be able to see, they were completely identical, as was the color and orange peel of the paint, further confirming that they were in fact both all original OEM paint.
The last test section was on the black paint roof that obviously had a diverse paint. But generally, my process here is to just try the same combination to see if it'll also work. And sometimes it does, but many times it doesn't. Having a look at the results on the roof was actually a little more tricky to assess due to the existing inconsistency of the finish and also for what turned out to be a softer and far more sensitive single stage paint. And for those of you that have come across older single stage acrylics or enamels, you'll know that they are perhaps the most difficult of all to finish without haze or marring. And due to the increased levels and severity of the defects on the roof, a lighter combination just wasn't able to remove them but my current combination was just too aggressive to finish well. So as I mentioned earlier, in many cases such as this, it's just impossible to single stage paint to a high level outcome. Fortunately though, all I had to do was go back to my very first combination using the orange pad with classic polish, which worked perfectly as a second final stage. And as you will hopefully see, even a little later on, the result was really outstanding. So with all my testing sorted out for the meantime, it was basically time to get down to business and get the paint looking as good as new, if not better. Now unfortunately, Lake Country doesn't make one or two inch versions of the SEO pads. And if you're listening Lake Country, please do. But the closest pad in those smaller sizes I have is a yellow rippers pad, which seems to finish just as well but just lacks a little cut by comparison, which I'll be using on the Rippers 2 inch TA50 polisher for the super intricate areas and some panel edges. And I'll be using the 3 inch pad on the Shinemate EX603 mini polisher for many of the other smaller to medium areas and panel edges, followed by the 5 inch pads on the Rippers LHR15 polisher for the larger, flatter areas. Now trying to achieve a high-end paint correction result with just large 5 or 6 inch polishes and pads just isn't possible as you simply can't get great correction around those tighter and finer panel areas or sharp curves and creases. But even more so important, a large polisher placed on a panel edge or crease is just too aggressive and largely increases the likelihood of burning through the paint, which if you've ever experienced that, it's a horrible gut-wrenching feeling that just can't be undone. But if you try and use the smaller 2 or 3 inch pads to correct the whole car, it's just going to take forever. So having a selection of large, medium and smaller pads and machines not only allows you to achieve higher levels of quality and results in your work, but it also allows you to work more efficiently using the right size pad for the right size area. And I'm not saying that you have to have all these machines and pads or else you can't correct automotive paint but I am saying that all these machines and pads used correctly and to your advantage with proper understanding can in fact take your work and results to the next level. But without proper knowledge, ability and patience, 
all these machines are a waste of time and money. Which ultimately means that it's up to you and you alone in having the potential and patience to make good use of them. So as I continue to correct the paint on the bonnet, you'll see me switch from my 2, 3 and 5 inch pads and machines depending on which area of the panel I'm working on. And I also want to stress that just because this is a single stage correction, it in no way means that it was a quick job in the least. In fact, this turned out to be one of the most time consuming paint correction jobs I've done to date, spending upwards of 40 hours on the paint correction alone. And it's the fact that I was able to find that perfect single stage combination that allowed me to put more time and focus into achieving the best correction possible in each and every area of the vehicle. One final point I'll make here is that in many cases, you are your worst enemy. It's human nature to try and speed things up by working larger sections, using more product, faster machine speeds and so on. But if you start deviating from your original test section methods and techniques, you'll also start deviating from those quality results. And as much as I'd like to tell you that there's a quicker and faster way, there simply isn't without compromising the results. So you are your worst enemy in that you have to remain consistent from start to finish and just accept that quality work takes time and perseverance. But I'll also add that you shouldn't beat yourself up too much if you spot a tiny imperfection or minuscule scratch here or there, as there is nothing or no job that is 100% perfect and anyone who claims otherwise is living in a fantasy world. With the bonnet completed, hopefully you can see just what a vast improvement it truly is over the existing paint. And although I realise it's hard to fully appreciate it on camera, the metallic flakes were just popping out of the paint and really starting to take on warmer tones and shades of colours that I just couldn't see before. Now although the owner didn't opt for a glass coating on the car, I still decided to give all the glass a deep clean and polish to address a few water spots and a bit of hazy film that was masking the glass's clarity. Now as I've mentioned numerous times in the past, you really don't have to overthink your combination when it comes to glass, as due to its extreme hardness it's almost impossible to create haze or marring in the finish of glass unless you're being crazy aggressive with your product choice and technique. So more or less, polishing glass is about giving it a super clean, addressing any water spots and just restoring its clear transparency. 
but in the case that you are intending to protect it with a glass coating, my experience has shown that the coating itself will perform much better and last twice as long if you polish the glass beforehand. Yesterday wasn't easy, I had to say goodbye to my best friend, thought to the end we'd be homies, but by the end he didn't even know me, so I went and made some new friends, they didn't know a thing about me, so I went and gave some tough skin, that's when I grew into the new me. Now on the underside of the bonnet, you'll see me using Shine Supply Slickback, which is an SiO2 based all-in-one primer polish, meaning that it can also be used as a base layer to accept a ceramic coating, but also just be used on its own for some light gentle polishing and a little paint protection in place. And much like super cleaning the glass, I'm basically using it to clean some of the under panels and door jams, which again weren't really part of this detailing job but just something extra I decided to do to enhance the overall finish of the vehicle as a whole. So apart from actually removing paint defects, a light polish is a great way to clean the paint, especially in areas like door jams and under panels, where water and mineral deposits and grime tend to build up. Much like the glass, underbody panels and door jams, I ended up removing the wipers to also give them a quick polish, but more so to remove some older polish or wax residue which had stained the black finish and was really detracting from the car's overall finish. These and a few more little things that you may see me do throughout this detail aren't overly time consuming things to do on their own but add them all up together and it does in the end end up adding an extra day or two to the whole detailing process. I know that for some of you that don't run a business, it can be difficult to understand why I'd be doing such a time consuming detailing job without doing things like removing the wheels, polishing the glass, door jams or giving the interior a clean. But everything, big or small, takes time and ultimately costs money and not every customer cares about or has the funds to pay for every single service I have on offer, nor should they be forced to. 
So ultimately, it's up to the customer to select the services and cost that meets their budget and needs. And I realize that it's usually just one or two idiots that decide to judge me based on not removing the wheels or detailing the interior. But to that idiot or two, it's called running a successful business. Next up was tackling the roof, door pillars and pillar arches. Now as you saw previously, the black paint in these areas was in a far worse state than the rest of the paint and did require a two-stage process to achieve a quality result. But as you'll hopefully see, the finish on this soft and sensitive paint really did come up extremely well and honestly better than I expected based on how it was to start with. I'll just let the footage run for a bit while I take a break from talking, but I'll pick it up again once we get to the rear tail lights. Gonna come a light your soul Gonna travel space time Gonna miss and free your mind This is crash Paris day Feel like Jonah
As it turns out, the massive rear tail light assembly was extremely difficult to level down the existing scratches. And my guess would be that it was due to there being no clear coat on them, so I was more or less correcting the clear plastic itself, which is far harder than any clear coat. As such, and after a bit of testing, I switched to using a microfiber pad with Shine Supply's most aggressive compound, Chop Top. Now, I still had to do a couple of sets of passes in each area to remove the majority of the scratches, but I also found that the same combination I was using on the rest of the paint made a great second stage polish to eliminate the compounding haze caused by using the microfiber pad with a more aggressive compound. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, the rear left quarter panel had been repainted in the past and also had a burn mark on the panel where you could see the original paint beneath. So in the same manner that I approached the roof, I used the same combination to see if it would work well on this aftermarket paint. Now, it did actually address all the existing defects, which was great. However, there was a definite haze left in the finish indicating that the paint was perhaps a little softer and more sensitive than the original OEM paint. So I then stepped back to the orange pad with classic polish, which was the same second stage I used on the roof, and it nicely cleaned up all that haze to reveal a far better and glossier finish, which I was quite happy with. But the truth is that this repainted quarter panel and the rear bumper just don't have the same quality of finish as the original OEM paint. And although I still can certainly get them looking their absolute best, a lot of the time you just need to accept that your paint correction work can only be as good as the paint you're given to work with. And seeing that there's already a burn mark in the finish, potentially indicating that the paint is also quite thin, you need to tread lightly and not go too far with your correction, but thankfully I was able to complete the whole quarter panel with no issues at all, and honestly achieved quite an amazing finish that apart from that subtle existing burn mark, it'd be quite difficult to even spot the difference of this panel compared to the rest of the paint. Okay guys, this is the part of the video where I cue the music and let the paint correction work do the talking, but I'll jump back in towards the end to wrap up this video.
Chasm words, callous words, trying to drive a wedge between us. Lonely mornings, secret codes. I just gave up keeping the score. Slander or liars, nothing can stop us, baby. This is a time. Yes, I know it's sad that the video is almost over, but the good news is that part 3 will be coming up shortly. While I had the car up on the hoist, I also dressed the tyres using Shine Supply Decked Out, which I gotta say is a bit of a standout tyre dressing. But my advice would be to dilute it 1 to 2 parts water, give it an hour or so to settle, and then give it a quick wipe down for that perfect satin finish. And although coating the rims was again not part of this job, I did, out of the kindness of my heart, give them a coat of CarPro Deluxe for some added protection and an enhanced look and finish. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please like, comment and subscribe to this channel to show your support for these videos and I'll see you guys soon in part 3 and the final chapter of this Honda NSX series.